Well, welcome to or welcome back to the 510 Report, where we talk about industry news, advocacy, and general goings on. Thank you so much for joining me. The first little bit of news that I wanted to talk about this week is something that I usually mention at the end of the 510 Reports, but I want to mention it here at the beginning, Kasa.org. Org. We are getting into a brand new legislative season nationally, and Kasad.org is truly and honestly the only place you're going to be able to keep up with all of this vape legislation that's happening across the country. If you're not a fan of getting emails from Kasad.org, at the very least, I would suggest you get on Twitter and follow Kasa Media on Twitter. I'll put a link down in the description to their Twitter account. They post lots of news, lots of updates, lots of things going on that aren't getting covered by a lot of, I don't know, other mainstream media accounts. And even just glancing at their Twitter right now, they have heads up news for legislation happening in Maryland, in Nebraska, in Erie County, New York. Lots of things are going to start happening and it's important to be plugged into news outlets that are gonna give you the news that you want. And the first actual story that I wanted to talk about today doesn't really have anything to do directly with vaping, but I'm not really gonna pass up an opportunity to show off some big pharma corruption. After all of the talking that we did about pharma for the last few weeks, it seems like there's nothing else they could possibly do. But this article from Reuters out of Boston has a big headline on it that says, former incest CEO pleads guilty to opioid kickback scheme. So Michael Babich, the former CEO of incest, pled guilty recently to officials as part of a plea deal where he pled guilty to conspiracy charges and mail fraud charges. This is happening as some of his former employees and other executives of the company are being officially charged with participating in this scheme. This includes one-time billionaire founder and former chairman of INSYS, John Kapoor. Babich himself, as it stands, faces up to 25 years in prison for participating in this scheme. The prosecutors allege in this case that between 2012 and 2015, Babich, Kapoor, and other executives from the INSYS pharmaceutical company conspired to bribe doctors to prescribe a product called Subsys. Subsys is an orally administered fentanyl spray. Now, if you're not super familiar with fentanyl, according to the DEA, it is an opioid that is 80 to 100 times stronger than morphine. It was originally developed as a pain management drug for cancer patients. Fentanyl also has an insanely high likelihood of abuse. Fentanyl is added to the drug heroin to increase heroin's potency and is such a powerful opioid that it sometimes gets passed off as heroin. It says many users are actually purchasing heroin that is 100% fentanyl and they don't know the difference, which leads to more overdose deaths. Fentanyl is really, really intense, nasty stuff. Obviously, this trial still has to happen, but I think just the fact that the former CEO has already confessed to this is a little bit telling. And of course, the only real reason that they conspired to bribe these doctors to prescribe their drug was as always, to make more money. They wanted to sell more opioids despite the fact that opioids in 2017 caused over 47,000 deaths. So clearly pharmaceutical companies are all about public health. And like I said, this doesn't directly tie to vaping, but I want everyone to remember this article and remember this trial every time you see a pharma-funded group like the Campaign for Tobacco-Free Kids spreading misinformation about vapor products. Because as as we have discussed before, and I will be linking to down in the description, vaping is very, very much getting in the way of these big pharmaceutical revenue streams. And it's pretty clear from this case that they are willing to do anything to keep those revenue streams intact, including bribing doctors to prescribe powerful opiates. Big pharma, always looking out for public health. So shifting gears a little bit from that, I wanted to talk about an article that came out from NBC News, and I truly and honestly don't even know where to start with this article. I'm not going to be linking it down below just because I don't really want to drive any more traffic or page views to this article, but it's really easy enough to find. It's all over lots and lots of different websites and news media outlets, and all of the articles are the exact same copy and paste format word for word across the internet. This particular article stuck in my craw like nothing I've ever experienced before. I genuinely feel like NBC should be a 
ashamed of themselves for even publishing this. But the big headline on this article says, Vaping sent this teenager into rehab. His parents blame Jules heavy nicotine dose. His parents blame Jules heavy nicotine dose. His parents blame Jules heavy nicotine dose. Before we even start talking about this article, I think it's important to point out that none of the doctors that worked directly with this case were interviewed for this article. None of them, zero of them. The only person interviewed in this article was the boy's mother and Dr. Sharon Levy, who is the director of the Adolescent Substance Use and Addiction Program at Harvard Medical School, who Sharon Levy, by the way, had no affiliation with this particular case. She wasn't involved in, in any Way. She didn't directly talk to the boy. She didn't directly talk to the mother. She didn't directly talk to any of the doctors that directly talked to them. So the story goes like this. This kid, Luca, from Maryland, started picking up vaping. This kid doesn't really say why he started doing it, and it doesn't mention if he was a smoker prior to vaping. The only reason he gave was that he liked the buzz. He also claims that he needed to sell his clothes and sell his shoes in order to maintain this $150 a week jewel hat. Habit. Now, doing a little bit math and even leaning towards the conservative side of $150 a week jewel habit, that's vaping through 28 pods a week. That's essentially the equivalent of vaping over two cartons of cigarettes in one week, which I don't even think is physically possible. I, I don't know if anybody watching this has ever vaped a jewel pod before, but in order to vape 28 pods in one week, you would have to have every breath being vapor. Not only every breath being vapor, but every breath in your sleep being vapor. That is an ungodly amount of pods and an ungodly amount of nicotine. If Luca was actually taking in that much nicotine, he would would have stopped immediately. He would have got headaches right away and he probably would have started vomiting from all of the nicotine. 28 pods a week is not sustainable. He, he would have been constantly, constantly sick and nauseous and headaches. The article talks about how he went from being a straight A student, of course he was a straight A student, but he went from a straight A student to an F student. His mother says his behavior became explosive and angry. He had no interest in activities he used to love like Boy Scouts and fishing. And apparently what brought all of this to a head was he had a seizure while hanging out with his girlfriend. They called an ambulance and he ended up in the emergency room. The mother said she tried to talk to other doctors, pediatricians, neurologists, and couldn't get anyone to listen to her when she said that the seizure was preceded by juuling. I'm assuming that they didn't listen to her because they're doctors and they know that the jewel doesn't cause seizures, or that this kid was actually mixed up with something else, which we're gonna talk about in just a second. So according to the mother, she went on the internet and found that quitting nicotine should be treated like substance abuse, which if you go on the internet right now, you can pause the video and do this. Google the term nicotine addiction treatments and tell me what comes up. None of those are going to say to treat it like a substance abuse issue. Most of the articles have helpful information about maybe try chewing gum, maybe try getting more fresh air, maybe try not to think about cigarettes, maybe just push through those cravings. Not one of them is going to tell you to check yourself into rehab. And again, in this article, there are zero doctors interviewed that worked with Luca. But this article does interview two star rated Dr. Sharon Levy, who Sharon Levy is an anti-nicotine advocate, anti-vaping advocate, prohibitionist to begin with. And she just kind of reinforces everything that this stupid mother was talking about earlier. How she herself has seen an intense influx of kids and students who don't know how to quit jewels and people who are coming in asking to be evaluated for jewel and nicotine addiction and obviously not backing this up with any sort of, you know, numbers or data or anything. And of course, in order to continue the narrative of the epidemic, they mention that the FDA is now currently trying to crack down on cigarettes and prevent things like this that happened to Luca to happening to other people. What happened to Luca is not ever going to happen to other people that vape. There are roughly uh, 10 million vapors in the United Kingdom, I believe, and right around 8 or 9 million vapors in the United States. And that's just two countries of which there have been 
zero reported cases of people going to rehab for nicotine addiction, except for Luca. Sandra Levy in this article also said, kids are coming in with problems like difficulty in focusing, common symptoms of withdrawal, things like headaches, sometimes fatigue, stomach aches, which might be a symptom of nicotine toxicity or poisoning in some of them. Difficulty focusing, headaches, fatigue, those are all symptoms of quitting nicotine. The quitting nicotine symptoms are very, very low, very, very mild, maybe some minor agitation, maybe some fatigue, maybe some headaches, but that's not the symptoms that Luca had. Remember at the beginning of this article, the mother talked about the symptoms that Luca had. Explosive, angry behavior, good grades to bad grades. He stopped things he used to love like Boy Scouts and fishing. Now again, I I'm not a doctor and I am not a scientist and I would like to thank Wayne from DIY or Die for bringing this subject up, but this kid's symptoms, yeah, he was a Xanax addict. All of Luca's symptoms, his aggressive anger behavior, his disinterest in things he used to love, Boy Scouts and fishing, those are signs of Xanax abuse. Now, what I think happened, which obviously I cannot prove, but from his symptoms, it's pretty clear he had a Xanax addiction and that's why he went to rehab. I genuinely think the story about him spending $150 on Juul Pods and vaping 28 Juul Pods a week, I think that's pure hogwash. We have this stupid mother that lets her stupid kid pick up vaping. And then when the kid gets addicted to nicotine, they blame the product? That is an unprecedented claim to make. And I know I've said this in the past and I'm gonna say it again right now, but if some idiot underage kid drinks and drives and gets in a car accident and injures himself or God forbid kills somebody, do we blame the alcohol company? Do we blame Jack Daniels Distillery for creating a product that this kid abused? Yet in this fabrication, we're blaming Jewel. We're blaming Jewel for the actions of a stupid mother and a stupid kid. In the article, Levy goes on to say, we've had kids who come in and say they can't concentrate in school, that they need to leave the classroom, they need to sneak out to the bathroom so that they can hit their Jewel, or that they need to go to the nurse's office because they just need to lie down. Down. That's something we didn't see in use of cigarettes. This is very concerning. This is really uncharted territory and we don't know what use of nicotine in this way is doing to the developing adolescent brain. Sneaking out of the classroom to go to the bathroom to hit their jewel? That's something that you never saw in cigarettes, Dr. Levy? Am I wrong or was there a chart-topping hit in the 80s called Smokin' in the Boys Room? Maybe Motley Crue just meant to name it hanging out in the boys' room with my friends and we're definitely not in here smoking. I smoked in the boys' room in high school. Never seen this with cigarettes before? Give me a break. And then of course, at the end of the article, Dr. Sandra Levy uses this opportunity to introduce the idea of using possible drug therapies from big pharmaceutical companies on your children so that they can somehow stop vaping. And then there's a quote from Luca himself that ends this article that has nothing to do with anything. He genuinely just sounds like a rebellious 15 year old teenager. I thought that everybody else was making me change. I didn't think that it was smoking or anything like that. I thought it was just the fact that the world is against me, so I should be against the world. So that is where I'm gonna leave that article. Of course, I'd love to get your feedback down in the comments below. I definitely think there is more to this story than some stupid kid vaping 28 jewel pods and having to go to rehab. Yet they are using this to further push the agenda of that youth epidemic. The author of this article, Maggie Fox, and NBC should be ashamed for publishing it. But I think that's where we're gonna end the 510 report this week. And I know I already mentioned it at the beginning, but I'm gonna mention it again here, kasa.org. Go and sign up, it's free and easy. All you need is an email. If you wanna know about possible bad or negative vape legislation coming up in your particular city, area, or state, join kasa.org. Follow the calls to actions. And as the great Kevin Skipper always said, you don't have to do everything, but you do have to do something. Let's get involved. <laughs>